is my true pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Renesa Anthony uh, is a licensed physician, public health practitioner, and the deputy director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. In addition her, to her uh, well-rounded education and personality, her, her uh, professional and personal commitment to eradicating health disparities and improving the lives of women, children, and families has developed over a myriad of professional and personal experiences, both nationally and internationally. She is, some of her most no notable achievements include being honored by the U.S. Surgeon General for her contribution to the Surgeon General's Conference on Preterm Birth, testifying before, the con before Congress in support of the Affordable Care Act, which everybody loves. Yes. Yes, I do. And being invited back to Congress today, it passed, earning the 2010 American Public Health Association Leadership and Advocacy Award. In 2011, the National Medical Association Top Doctors Under 40 Award also was given to her, and in 2012, being selected as the TEDx Omaha presenter. I'll let you tell them what the TEDx <laughs> presenter is. She embraces the framework of mentoring and mentors women across the lifespan to achieve both personal and professional goals. Dr. Anthony earned her medical degree at the University of Chicago, Master's of Public Health at Harvard University, medical training in obstetrics, obstetrics and gyneco gyne gynecology and Vanderbilt <laughs> University, and a fellowship in health policy at the National Institute of Health in the Office of the Surgeon General. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to actually be here tonight. I got here in a record-breaking time of 55 minutes from my door to here. Do not repeat that. I mean, I got, <laughs> please don't. It was a calculated public health risk. Um, apologies for the time. I didn't want to have my back to you the entire time, so we had to figure out something that was going to work because I don't have a clicker. And when I do these kinds of talks, I like to interact and learn from the audience as well because I feel there's something I can learn every day. And it's not just about my experience, but our collective experience to achieve health equity together. So this is what it kind of looks like outside, but most of us wish we could be here, right? Yes. So I'm going to have everyone stand up. I like to start my talks like this. So I want everyone to take a deep breath. I want you to leave in the ocean that to-do list. I want you to leave in the ocean all the things that you're working on. And we're going to completely center and be present for the next 50 minutes. A couple of more deep breaths before we get started. I'd like you to focus on just one thing that you're extremely grateful for today. And we're going to take just one last deep breath. You can open your eyes and reach and blow it all out. You may be seated, as they say at my church. <laughs> Thank you. So I was introduced, and I tell people I'm a physician by passion, public health practitioner, um, and a public health practitioner, and I'm a deputy director at the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at UNMC. As I give this talk, I'll share a little bit about my journey to how I got to where I am, so I'm not going to focus on that here during my introduction. There's no way I can go over everything in an hour that has to do with health equity, and so we will tailor this over the next 50 minutes to things that I think are quite pertinent and fun. So before we can do this, it's important for me to know who I'm talking to, so who's here? How many are Nebraskans in the room from Nebraska? Majority, as I expected. Uh, I know I have a New Yorker back there <laughs> and a colleague from Obi-Gyne. 
Um, how many live urban in town, Lincoln? Any folks from rural areas in the state? Couple, thank you. Any teens in here? <laughs> yes, Susan. Well done, well done. Uh, people in their 20s. So very jealous, but I lie and still say I'm 20 something. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 70s, 80s. So we have from the 20s to the 80s across the life course. Thank you. Uh, how many students? Hi, Larissa. <laughs> uh, professionals in public health. People who actually do health disparities work. A few. How many are parents in here? 50, 60 percent. Okay. And as I talk about these issues that I work on, it's important for me to know how much about these that you know so that I don't dumb it down or make it too um, advanced. And so I'm going to ask an inventory of one, two, and three. One is, mm, I don't know very much about that topic at all. Two is, I've heard of that topic before. I know a little bit. And three is you can sit down because I could probably take care of this part of your presentation for you. So when it comes to the social determinants of health, just by your finger, are you a one, two, or a three? Lots of twos. I'm always looking for my threes to call on, and the ones are the folks I have to convince in the room. <clears throat> All right, health disparities. mostly twos and threes. What about the life course perspective? Wow, I didn't hear about the life course perspective until about five years ago, so this is a pretty advanced group. Uh, and the eye care factor. So one is, hmm, I just came because I have a class and they told me I needed to come. <laughs> Two is, you know, I'm really interested in these things and I like to learn. And three is, not only do I care about this, I'm willing to do something about it. Come on, there's nobody here who had to be here. <laughs> Those are the ones in the back who didn't vote at all. <laughs> so what are we going to do today? Why did you come? Why have you dedicated your time? We're going to come to a common understanding. We're going to walk in the shoes of the people that we serve or the community that we uh, want to improve. We're going to discuss the issues. And then we're going to focus on solutions. And then you're going to go out and you're going to change the world or at least make it a better place. This is really odd because I'm used to walking around and having a clicker and I don't, so I'm doing what needs to be done. Your active participation is really appreciated um, and strongly encouraged. So what is health? Because before we can talk about health disparities or health equity, we have to have a common understanding of what health is. Absence of disease. Absence of disease. I'll take that. Anybody want to add to it? Overall well-being. Well Dr. Bachrath. I like overall well-being. Overall well-being. Anybody else? <coughs> Feeling good. Well, in academia, we use these very fancy um, definitions. And the WHO says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And what we'll be talking about today is that social aspect because all of us have a role in which we can improve social health in our communities. What are health disparities? Access for a certain um, population versus another. I hear access over here. What about that side of the room? This side's winning. <laughs> That side's bigger. <laughs> what are health disparities? Difference in quality of care. Differences in quality of care. Okay. Inequities. Inequities. Like what kind? Like not the same services available everywhere. And I think access. 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 Okay. Barriers to insurance. Barriers to. Barriers to paying insurance, to insurance and getting, so access to insurance, yeah. access to care. You had your hand up, sir? Yeah, usually in comparison to another group of people. 
So a marginalized population, perhaps compared to a dominant culture. Absolutely. So those are all um, definitions that would fit under the umbrella of health disparities. And the National Institute says health disparities are differences in the incidence, which are new cases of things. So I am what my father would call a vaginologist. And I think of things from a sexual perspective. And so all my examples have to do with women or STDs. So for this example, I'm going to use HIV. So incidents are all the new cases this year of people who have been diagnosed with HIV. Prevalence are the people who have been diagnosed in the past, and because we can't cure HIV, those are the people who have existent numbers and are considered HIV positive. Mortality are those who have died from HIV, and the burden of disease is what we call morbidity. So if you're HIV positive and you have cancer, as a result, there are certain cancers that are specifically related to HIV, like cervical cancer, for instance, then that's a morbidity. And we know that there are differences in certain groups with different populations in the United States. And I like this part about special population groups because when we talk about disparities, what often happens, especially when I'm talking, is that people think of skin only and skin color and racial and ethnic disparities. But right here in Nebraska, we have disparities between rural groups and urban groups. When I was going, um, I'm being recorded, so when I was a law-abiding citizen getting here <laughs> from Omaha, the reality is down I Highway 80, if I would have gotten in an accident, I probably have a much higher likelihood of surviving that accident than if I were to get in that accident, say, in the middle of the state out where North Platte is. Um, to get to me from uh, North Platte for the helicopter to leave UNMC or somewhere from Denver, the time that it takes, I could completely have a traumatic brain injury, bleed out, and that's it. And so geographic location um, is also a health disparities. So in the United States, people live long. What do you think is the average lifespan? This side. 78, we got folks in here in their 70s, right? And they don't look like they're going anywhere anytime to me, <laughs> or I hope not. So 78, what about this side? 81, 78 to 81, anybody want to give a difference? Is that a good range for you? 70, 75, 87 for women, okay. Can't click, gonna get my exercise. The U.S. life expectancy ranges from 70 to 83. I can't add, I'm not an engineer, what's 83 minus 70? 13. 13. And by a show of hands, how many people, if you could have 13 additional years of quality life, would turn it down? So everybody would want 13 additional years of life if you could be healthy. There are factors that we know everybody is not going to be afforded 83 years of life. And the sad part is there was a time where I delivered babies, and based on the gender, the race, and if you gave me the zip code these days of that baby, I could be almost within 75% correct of the life expectancy of that child, short of they get in an accident in I-80 or a helicopter or a plane falls on them. <laughs> so the data says, this is one of the greatest examples of health disparities. We know that from a racial standpoint and a gender standpoint, that everyone is not afforded the same amount of life. White females live the longest, and the difference between Caucasians and African American women, that's a disparity. That's a difference. Disparity is just a fancy word for differences. And what we want to do is understand in the work that I do, why is it that these lines aren't the same? Why is it that when you're born, and you're born female, which you have no control over, and you're born African American or you're born Hispanic, that there is a difference in terms of prediction of how long you will live. Can someone tell me why African American men live the shortest? What's driving those, those trends and those numbers? Violence. violence. What about violence? Violence in the young, so it brings down because they died in their teens and 20s. Absolutely. So that's the point because when people show you graphs, and at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I'm sure in, at the University of Lincoln they probably do it too, um, we're good at just showing you the data. 
And what I've realized is very few people stop and say, well, why does the data look that way? And this is what led me into the work that I do because when I was a medical student, they would show me stuff like this. And I would go to class and I would sit in the front row and they would say African Americans have the highest incidence rates of this, 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 and that. And I sat there and I often said, well, why? Why do the statistics look the way they do? Why am I paying 200 and something thousand dollars over the course of four years to learn this information? But the people that we're talking about are my family members. The people we're talking about are folks that I grew up in the church with. The folks we're talking about are the parents and grandparents of my friends. And they don't know anything about what we're talking about. And so focusing on how we can make these numbers more um, similar and how we can reduce the gaps is really important. For a long time, we only collected data on white and black people, right? But in the United States, and especially in Nebraska, the Hispanic population in Nebraska doubled almost and increased by 80% uh, in Nebraska in 10 years. But we now know that Hispanic females actually live the longest. And there's a lot of um, postulations as to why that is. Um, one is that Hispanics that actually come to the United States have what's called a uh, Hispanic paradox. So healthier people are likely to immigrate to different places than the sick ones. And so you have a healthier population in the place in which they immigrated. So what do you think are some of the leading US health disparities, if we were to look at it from a disease standpoint? Diabetes, Diabetes that's one. Cancer is another. Heart disease, of course. Obesity, this time. Food deserts, and that plays into obesity and heart disease and diabetes, but that's a good thought. HIV and other STDs. HIV and STDs. If I said a kid presents to the emergency room and they sound like this, <gasps> asthma, and usually 10 times out of 15, what do they look like? They're African American, so asthma is a huge, um, and, and that's an environmental issue. <laughs> So these are the leading health disparities in the United States. Infant mortality, we didn't talk about, but that's what I'm very passionate about. And in Nebraska, our trends are very similar, except like I said, we have higher accidental deaths um, and STDs in Douglas County. So health disparities can be quite complex. I teach a 16-week course on health disparities. And again, in an hour, there's no way to go through all of this. But this is just looking at race and ethnicity health disparities. And again, there's geography and there are a couple of other kinds that we'll talk about today. How many people, by a show of hands, has seen unnatural causes? So just a few. Great. I'm glad I have the clip. I'm going to show you a clip because, again, it's about getting on the same page. There's one view of us as biological creatures that we are determined by our genes. That what we see in our biology is somehow innately us because of who we were born to be. What that misses is that we grow up and develop. We grow up as children, we grow up as adults and continue. We interact constantly with the world in which we are engaged. That's the way in which our biology actually happens. We carry our history in our bodies. How else could, how could we not? Living in America should be a ticket to good health. We have the highest gross national product in the world. I'm very happy to finally have some of my cars in one location, some of them. 
We spend two trillion dollars per year on medical care. That's nearly half of all the health dollars spent in the world. But we've seen our statistics. We live shorter, often sicker lives than in any other industrialized country. We rank 30th in life expectancy. Especially of economically developed countries, we are at the bottom of the list. A higher percentage of our babies die in their first year of life than in Cuba, Slovenia, Estonia. How can this be? Is this just because 47 million of us have no health insurance? Healthcare can deal with the uh, diseases and illnesses, but a lack of healthcare is not the um, cause of illness and disease. It is like saying, since um, aspirin cures uh, a fever, that the uh, lack of aspirin must be the cause of the fever. Or is it mostly because of our American diet and personal health behaviors? Those behaviors themselves, in part, determined by economic status. And so our ability to avoid smoking and eat a healthy diet depends, in turn, uh, on our access to income, education, and what we call the social determinants of health. But wouldn't our genes trump social determinants of health? Among twins who live together until age 18, who basically grew up in the same households, so had at least a relatively similar exposure. If they diverged later in life, if one became professional and the other was working class, they ended up with different health status as adults. This is among identical twins. Written into our bodies is a lifetime of experience, shaped by social conditions and policies that can determine who will be sicker, who will die sooner. There are ways in which our society is organized that are bad for our health. Uh, and there's no doubt that we could reconfigure ourselves in ways that would benefit our health. There are huge inequalities in the society. All this wealth is maldistributed. Pet food, ice for the pet's water. And I think that's in part why the U.S. as a whole has relatively poor health amongst the rich countries and why even the better of people are suffering. And we think that that is not inevitable. So that's just the five minute trailer. Um, this is about five hours with a couple of different um, topics through each of in the unnatural causes. And if you haven't seen them, I strongly recommend it so why am I here and why do I do what I do? Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. I was born 30 weeks, so I was 10 weeks premature, to a single mom. And I was lucky enough that when I was 13 years old, got a scholarship to go to an African American boarding school in Mississippi called Piney Woods. And I sit on the board of that school now. And Piney Woods was really the first time for me that I left my community where, in my Rome as I call it, my aspirations were to work at a Cracker Barrel or to do hair and nails because that's what leaders in my community did who were female like me. Now the men in Detroit, what do you think they did? I heard it. Cars. 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 My grandfather worked for GM for 40 years, and most men that I knew worked on the assembly lines, or they were forklift drivers for the car manufacturing um, industry. And of course, Detroit has completely crumbled as those jobs left and we moved uh, the companies or they got bailed out. Well, that's all I knew. I thought that men wouldn't work for the car companies. And girls and women, we went out and we did hair and nails or we worked at a place like the Cracker Barrel where my grandparents would take me and I wanted to work there because I wanted that um, apron. And it's got the stars and when you're a little girl, I was like, I want a, an apron with my name on it and a couple of stars. Well, when I was 13, my grandmother goes to a church and her good friend, her son, was the president of that school. And I remember when she said, 
you're going to Piney Woods. And I thought, I don't want to leave here. I don't want to go to Piney Woods. I'm, I'm happy where I am, um, but I didn't have a choice. So I was sent. And at Piney Woods, I will never forget, they asked me for the first time, where are you going to college? Not am I going to college, but where are you going to college? And I kind of looked, and I was like, I ain't going to college. I'm going to do hair and nails, just like that. <laughs> and it was, I am not. And I was like, no, I ain't. <laughs> and in the course of four years, I learned that, yes, I was going to college. And that ain't is not a word, even though it's in the dictionary. And I learned how to say yes, ma'am, and no, sir. But really what Piney Woods created was an environment that educated the head through academics, the heart through service, and everyone um, had to work, so educated our hands as well. Well, by the time I graduated from high school, um, I got a scholarship to the University of Minnesota, so our Big Ten rivals now. And at the time, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. And why did I want to be a veterinarian? Because now my role had changed again, where in my role in Detroit, I wanted to do hair and nails and work at the Cracker Barrel. My role now changed where I was working on a farm. And I thought, well, I can be a veterinarian. That's what I'm going to do. And I got a scholarship. But little did they tell me that when I finished my coursework, that my scholarship was up. Like, it was not going to pay for me to go to vet school. So between my fourth and supposed fifth year, because I was in a 3-5 program, where you do your first three years and you take your generals and all your courses, but your fourth year of undergrad, you get to take your pre-vet classes and actually be in classes with vet students. So I was really excited. And then all of a sudden, when I finished that fourth year, my money was gone. And I didn't have anyone I could call to co-sign for a loan or get loans for me. So what I did was I got a job, and I worked for Dow AgroSciences in Indiana. And when I moved to Indiana, it gave me an opportunity to go back and forth to Detroit. And when I went back home, my lens was radically different in what I saw. And what I saw was what a lot of people who do community work do. I saw all the problems. Right? So I had lived in Minnesota. By this time, I had been out of the country. I had been to Korea. I was a college student. I was doing really well. And I come home, and all I saw were the issues. What were some of those issues? Why is it when I come home, there's bulletproof glass everywhere? So I can't go to McDonald's even when I go home now. I cannot go to McDonald's. I cannot go to the corner store without an entire fronting of bulletproof glass. And then you have to hand over money through this thing that spins around. And then they give you what you want. And then they give you your change back. So I wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to when I had to pump gas. I had to get out of my car. And if I was going to use a credit card, I had to show ID because they assumed that the credit card was stolen. I also wasn't used to going to the grocery store and not finding fresh produce. Um, and to my dismay, finding grocery prices that were 15 to 50 cents more expensive than in the community that I lived in. But one of the things that stood out is all those kids that I grew up with, that I left and I didn't want to leave, many of them by this time now, all my girlfriends had, if not one, most of them had two babies. Most of them had baby daddy drama, meaning that they weren't together, and my baby's daddy does this, and my baby daddy does that. And I remember my good friend, I was sitting down, and I said, you know, why do you go through all this? She's all about her hair, and she's all about her nails, and it's expensive, right? So to get your hair done and your nails done probably costs about $50 each time just for um, your hair alone. And she said, because I said, well, you have two kids, you have a baby's daddy, why do you spend your money on these things when you can really be investing your money to do other stuff? And she shared with me, she said, I'm never going to be a doctor. I'm never going to be a lawyer. And this is my investment. So who I meet next and who I can attract next, that maybe I'll be lucky and meet a better person who will ultimately take care of me. And that opened my eyes and said, I want to do stuff with women and girls. And so other things were happening in Detroit, from my grandparents getting sick to my mom getting sick to going to the hospitals. And none of the doctors really understood the situation in which my family lived. So hearing things like, well, you need to get an exercise, uh, go to the gym, 
There are no gyms where we lived. Things like, these are the foods you should cook, and when you give them to my grandmother, that's not what she cooks for Thanksgiving. That's not what she cooks on Sunday. And so it wasn't culturally appropriate. And so I thought, maybe if I became the doctor, I could fix the problem. And so I got accepted to the University of Chicago, and I left Minnesota, went to Indiana, went back to Minnesota, from Minnesota, went to Chicago, and started med school. And on the south side of Chicago, I saw a lot, I heard a lot, and I really saw how medicine works. And I would see people who would come into the clinic or come into the emergency room who looked like me, and more times than not, they were presenting later with disease. So I had this lady who came in, she was in the emergency room, and you could see she had a huge pulsating vessel. And I asked her, well, how long has that been there? And she was like, oh, it's been there for a while. You know, it wasn't bothering me, so I didn't think about it. And then I said, well, what made you come in today? Well, her daughter saw it and said she needed to come in. Now, she's coming through the emergency room for this, which I'm glad she did come through the emergency room. But this is something that, in usual, you would probably go to a primary care physician to see, but she didn't have one. Well, lo and behold, that big vessel was an aneurysm of her abdominal aorta, which if it ruptures, it can kill you. Most times, if it does rupture, it will kill you. So because she came through the ER, we were able to get her upstairs to vascular. And when I called that consult, the reality was, since she's stable, we don't take her here. We had to shift her off to Cook County. So as long as a patient is stable, you can transport them or transfer them to another institution. And that woman looked like me. That woman looked like someone that you know I grew up with. And I just couldn't understand at that point, like, why, why aren't we taking care of her? Why is she being shipped off to another hospital when she presented to us? And there are many stories I can tell you similar to that. Anyway, I decided um, everything I loved was women's health. Everything I read and didn't flip to the back of the book to see how many more pages I had to go. Um, I felt comfortable saying things like vagina and gonorrhea. I do not feel comfortable saying penis, though. It's a word that I don't say often, because um, it's not the work I do. But one of the things that really, really got to me when I was a medical student was the picture of this woman and this woman here. And so if I were to ask you, because they're both pregnant, which one do you think is most likely to have a baby born full term? The one on the right or the one on the left? Right? Um, who's most likely to have a baby with asthma? Who's most likely to have high blood pressure during her pregnancy? Who's most likely to have a husband? Who's most likely to have a baby that will actually blow out their first birthday candle? This one. This gets into the whole infant mortality piece. Uh, which one's more likely to have graduated from high school? More likely to have graduated from college? Most likely to have gestational diabetes. So we don't know anything about these women. Nope. We know their gender. We know their race. We know they're pregnant. <coughs> and we know what the statistics say. And for two years, I sat in my medical school classes, and I learned how incidence rates for gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, hypertension, infant mortality, you name it, you look like this. And again, my question was why, 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 and why? Because I don't think you should be able to look at people and make those predictions. So this is the reason why I do the work that I do. The other reason I do the work I do is that I love babies. I loved when I delivered them. Um, but I didn't love that, again, I could look at them and I knew who was going to do well and who was going to do poor. The nice thing is in the NICU, African American girls actually do the best when they're born early. But as you look across the lifespan, there are differences, and those differences come from our environment as well, as to why we start to see um, trends that change. So kids, they aren't born with asthma. What happens? Why is it that we see more African American kids with asthma? Environment. The environment. What specifically in the environment? Smog, pollution. Smoking, pollution, smog. Cockroaches is another one, and um, allergy to cockroach feces. 
But it's a huge issue. And if you see on Natural Causes, they did a community development piece in which they built these homes that had better air inside than they had outside. So they had these special filters. And kids who were suffering with you know, three, four visits a, a month to the ER started having visits less frequently, like two times a year. This is what got me when I said, I can't just deliver babies all day. I have to find something else to do to be able to address the issue. Because by the time patients come to me, they're already sick, they already have an issue, and very rarely do I get an opportunity to focus on what I love to do now, which is prevention. But this shows infant mortality rates. And so I'm not a mother. I still hope to someday be a mother. But what really gets me is that education is protective. So the more education you get, despite race, you are more likely to have uh, better outcomes when you compare in your same group. But if you're African American, like I am, in case you didn't know, um, and you have 16 plus years of education, that would be me, my risk of having a baby that is going to die in the first year exceeds that at 11.4 per thousand of a Caucasian woman who has less than 12 years of education. And that's a problem. So it goes down across educational um, sectors, but even here, it's 11.4, and that is an issue. So a lot of people talked about health care. And it's not just access to health care. It's these social determinants of health, poverty, education, housing, racism. A lot of people are doing research, like Kamara Jones, on the impact of racism. Employment, transportation, access to health care is what you talked about. And just to show, when you talk about community health, health care is just a small component of all the different factors that ultimately uh, contribute to community health. This is a life course perspective. Uh, Dr. Michael Liu uh, does a lot of work in this area before he became director at HRSA. But this really says that over the course of your life, there are different factors that impact your health. But they're all combined together in terms of your risk. And so early on, your family has a large influence on what you do, what you eat, where you go, your environment. So when I grew up in Detroit, for instance, I had no control that uh, my mom may have not had a public health person or a public health nurse knock on the door and teach her all about healthy eating and which fats are good and which fats are bad. And so I grew up in a household where whole milk or 2% milk was the norm, and it still is. Anybody still drink 2%? I mean, whole milk? Very few people. When I go home, my whole family, they are still on the whole whole milk thing. And to be honest, they think that 2% uh, milk is watered down. So when I try to explain to them it is not water, it's the fat that's been extracted, um, I get nowhere. And that's very frustrating as a physician that I can't even influence my own family sometimes. Uh, as you get older, you start to make your own individual choices. So smoking and drinking and what you choose to eat now becomes within your control. And I share a story about growing up in Detroit where it was a treat to go to places like Red Lobster. Anybody go to Red Lobster? I still go to Red Lobster, and I don't lie about it. When I grew up, anniversaries, birthdays, Red Lobster was like the treat, even though I had to order off the kid's meal. Well, when I became an adult, and I transitioned from Detroit to this black boarding school in Mississippi, to a Big Ten University in uh, Minnesota, to Chicago with students from Harvard and Yale and all these other places. I will never forget the embarrassment I felt when it was my birthday. I was like, let's go to Red Lobster. And they kind of looked at me like, you go to Red Lobster? We don't go to Red Lobster. And I thought, well, what's wrong with Red Lobster? Red Lobster's still good. And when I moved here, um, I won't share which birthday that was, I was like, I am going to Red Lobster. And I'm going to Red Lobster because now, after all this hard work, I can afford anything that's on the menu, and it's still really good food. But what we ate more of other than Red Lobster are things like Popeye's chicken. Anybody been there? Yesterday. Yesterday. OK, OK. <laughs> What'd you get? Do you like the Red 
beans and rice, that's my favorite. The red beans and rice and the biscuits, KFC, McDonald's, all those places. Taco Bell, back when they used to wrap the taco light that I got in this like aluminum foil stuff. That's what I grew up on. And oh, White Castle. They don't have a White Castle here. Well, as I went and transversed in and out of these different Romes, when you're in Rome, you tend to do what the Romans do. And it was at Minnesota that I learned people exercise, right? Where I come from, exercise is not a normal thing. People don't do it. They're working too many jobs. There are a lot of other priorities. And my roommate woke up, and she kept leaving. And I was like, where is she going? <laughs> and one day, I asked her, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go run. And that to me made no sense. Like, where? Where, <laughs> where are you running? Like, why, why would you go run? Because at the time, I could not connect. Running is cardioprotective. And what she's doing are things to protect her health while I'm studying and still trying to get to White Castle whenever I can, right? <laughs> because what you eat doesn't necessarily compute to how does that have anything to do with my heart when it goes to my stomach? How does that have anything to do with my blood pressure? And for the average person making those connections, it's not there. And you don't see the immediate impact and the immediate effects. So it's really hard to get behavior change. Well, what changed my behavior? Well, by the time I got to University of Chicago, I learned that you don't say, we're going to do our birthday at Red Lobster or let's go to Popeye's for lunch or dinner. And I moved here about three, four years ago. And I was on my way to the airport, and I needed to grab something really quick because I hadn't eaten. And I went to Popeye's. I made better choices. I got a kid's meal. Um, but I was not going to get on that airplane with my Popeye's bag. So I drove next door to Panera. And I got a Panera bag. And I put my Popeye's in the Panera bag. And then I was flying southwest, so when I got on, I made sure I went to the back so I could eat my Popeyes and nobody would see me do it. <laughs> now in Detroit, I can eat Popeyes all day and no one would say anything. The same thing when I was in Detroit. I've always been a bigger girl. I didn't know I was overweight till I went to Minnesota when my world shifted from a predominantly African American community to a predominantly Caucasian community. Because what is attractive in the Caucasian community where I grew up you get made fun of. And so when I lost 70 pounds as an undergrad and I went home, my grandmother made it her mission to feed me, to ridicule me, because now I've been with all those white people and I was too skinny. I was skin and bones, and that was an issue. So again, I'm really trying to drive home how your environment and your Rome can really impact your outcomes and your behaviors and what you do. And now that I work at a medical center, you know, the reality is if I don't smoke, but if I did, would I smoke more or less because I work at a medical center? Less. less. Um, our campus is smoke-free. Uh, there's a lot of stigma attached to being a physician if you smoke. So I do not smoke, but if I did, I would smoke just by default less. Compared to um, I'm moving my mom here and have been driving by a couple of construction sites, and I see you know, kind of communities being built and established around cigarette smoking. Mm -hmm. People take their cigarette breaks, they get together in their corral, it builds community, it builds report and, and camaraderie. And so where you work, where you live, all those pieces have a huge impact on your behavior and outcomes. So that was me then, and this is me now. And the biggest factor that plays into my life expectancy is the zip code in which I was born in. And that's unfortunate, because the zip code I was born in probably looks very much like this life expectancy of 73. So 95202 and 92606, those are California zip codes. Life expectancy in 606 is 88, compared to 202 is 73. Somebody tell me what. 606 probably looks like, without even going there. If I were to Google map it right now, what does it look like? Single family homes. Single family homes. Parks. Fast food. Who lives there? White people. Predominantly Caucasian. Uh, high income. What do you think crime's like over there? What's crime? Pretty low. Higher value of properties. 
Um, do you think people, if you were to go there, you would see them in the morning running? And in the evening running? Compared, oh, and walking the dog, that's another one. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. We had dogs throughout my lifetime. Every single dog we had, we found in the community. Like either they were on our back porch or we were walking and we found a dog and would take it home. But very rarely did we take our animals to the vet. So it was always a joke when I said I was gonna be a veterinarian because where I came from, people don't take their animals to the veterinarian anyway. But times are changing so, and I know why. I had to, uh, I was watching a, a friend's uh, dog last month and took it up to a colleague in Seward and her dog bit the 15 pound dog I had mm -hmm. and then I took the 15 pound dog to I think that's my alarm telling me on time I took the 15 pound dog to the animal urgent center and before they would even see her I had to pay $90 they would not see her without paying 90 bucks 90 bucks to see her and by the time it was all said and done with the radiographs to make sure that uh, her bowel was not perforated, $781. And she was fine. <laughs> Luckily for me and for the owner, my colleague, because their dog bit her, said that they would cover it, but that's still a lot of money. So what we know um, in the United States is that the greatest predictor of health is wealth. The more money you make, the more likely you are to live a longer life. Why would that be? Access to health care. Access to health care, okay. So you're more likely to have insurance the more money you have. Check. What else? Less stress. You can see specialists when you need to. Check. Good food. Education. What does education do? Awareness of what? Risk factors. So it decreases risk factors. Didn't hear her answer. Sorry. She was saying, um, he said that risk factors are decreased when you can get healthier foods. And she was talking more about the environment, so the choices that you can make as well. Less stress. Less stress. Big one. Stress doesn't necessarily change, it's less relentless stress. So I was stressed this entire week trying to get a grant in that I pressed send right before I had to speed down, I mean, follow the, the law and, and get here. Um, and that stress level I felt. But the reality is when I'm done with this, I can take a deep breath and I have control of my life again. Whereas there are people who over and over and over are insulted by that kind of stress. What else? With, with stress, if you have no money, Popeyes is the way to relieve the stress. If you have money, you can go to a movie or a theater or do things, or go to an expensive restaurant or sauna or whatever. Very true. And that speaks to family of origin things. And there's research coming out in that. So my family of origin, the cultural norm for perfect, protective health behaviors is very different than the community and the cultural norms in which I live in. But I can tell you, this past week, under the stress that I've been, I have eaten, or is it I've ate? Who's the grammar person? I ate, I've eaten. I got it right! <laughs> I have eaten worse than I have probably in the past six months. And I didn't go to Popeyes, but I ate brownies and chips and stuff that I went to food as a comfort place, but family of origin type of food. So this weekend I'm supposed to work out more. The biggest reason why income is protective, the more money you make, the more likely you are in an environment that has protective behaviors for health. The less money you make, the more likely you are in environments that by default have cultural nuances that are detrimental to your health. And so an but example. More, is, but you mean more than cultural, like also environmental? Yes, environmental. And when I say culture, I'm interchanging it between um, racial and ethnic culture to actually socioeconomic culture. And so that was the distinction there. So I'm talking about an SES culture. And that SES, there's how many people have read a book called Bridges Out of Poverty? Great book. And a very quick example. In Bridges Out of Poverty, they talk about 
what the norms are within that SES, the cultural norms within the social economic group, and that you must perfect those norms to be able to um, be effective and sustainable in that group. And if you switch from that group to another SES, you must learn the nuances and the rules in that next group and as you move on. So when you look at impoverished communities in which I grew up, when you eat and you're done, what do you think is the question? Are you full? Who said it? Are you full? Did you get enough? The focus is really on did you get enough? Are you full? For instance, growing up, taking Tupperware, not a problem. You can get a plate. You take it home with you. When I moved into more of a middle class community, what do you think the question is? Was it good? That's right. The focus goes from did you get enough, because that's not a question. There's more than enough if you want it. It's how good was it? Did you enjoy the meal? And then you move into that group, the upper echelon and the wealthy, where at the end of the day, it is not about did you get enough or how good it was. What do you think it's about? Aesthetics. What it looked like. How was it presented? And that was key for me when I read that book because I came here uh, by invitation of the former chair of my department when I was on faculty at George Washington University. I'm an Almohandas, became the dean of the College of Public Health here and invited me to come. And I'm is a very sophisticated person. He's a physician. He comes from a long line of Egyptian physicians. He's the type of person that when you go to his house, it's gorgeous. He has statues taller than I am in them. But every time he'd invite me to heat, eat, sometimes I kind of hated it. Like it was really good food. But it was never enough food. And I would wonder, why did they bring this plate of food with little dots and pretty stuff and just this little amount of food in the middle? And it was a 100 and something dollars. Like, I never got it until I read this book. And I'm like, well, I am coming from a completely different background. And I've transitioned across these different social economic classes. And now this makes sense. That's why we pay all this money for foo-foo looking food, because it's not about how did it taste? Did you get enough? It was, was it pretty? And so those have been helpful for me, but important to know as you're doing community work too. So where you work, live, play, and worship makes a tremendous impact on your health. And there's just one thing that I want to walk you through quickly because I know we're running out of time, to drive home that point. So this is a poverty simulator that you can access yourself, and it's called placement.com. How many people have done this before? Just a few. All right. So placement. Okay, so you're down to $1,000, which is a lot more than most people have in the communities that I serve. And you don't have a job, you lost your house, um, and you have to make it through the month. So I'm going to do it by side. On this side, do you want to get a job or you want to quit? Get a job. All right, and you don't have any money. Uh, you need to get a job. What kind of job would you like to do on this side? You can be a restaurant server. It's going to pay you $2.13. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. But I think that's what I made you do. The other options were you could work at a factory for $9, or you could have been a temp for $9. Um, you need a uniform. At the end of the day, you're going to make $262. So you got a job, now you're offered insurance. It's going to be $275 a month. What do you say? No, no, no you can't afford it. But luckily now, you can go to the health care exchange. Um, and I think I selected it for you. <laughs> <laughs> because you. I feel yes. that Thank health you. insurance is like the American Express card. Never leave home without it. So the problem is um, you got it. Your paycheck is going to be $70 less. But if you get sick, you'll be able to take care of it. The closer you live to work, the, ch the more expensive it is. The further away you live from work, the cheaper. 
So I think I'm over here. How much would you like to pay in rent? $262 a week. $760 if you live 50 miles out. $855 if you live in. $800. Okay. So we would do $800. You're 30 miles out. Um, lack of affordable housing is the number one cause of homelessness. For every dollar you save um, on housing, you're going to spend 77 cents on transportation. Your apartment's too small over here. Uh, what would you like to do? You can rent a storage unit for $45, or you can have a yard sale, because you don't have internet. Great, you made 150 bucks. <laughs> and then your landlord came in and was like, hey, you know, glad to have you here, but I'm going to be raising the rent, because uh, there are some things I need to do to this place. When you argue that the increase is illegal, you're told, well, if you don't like it, you can just move out. So do you want to find somewhere else to live, or you're going to pay the 150 bucks? <laughs> I like that. He says, I'm just not going to do anything, which is not an option. <laughs> I don't have the money to move, so I guess I'll pay the 150. You're going to pay the 150. All right, your car registration's due, but it's going to be $250 to get it rolled legal. What do you want to do? Pay the money or take your chances? All right, you're going to save the money in the short term, but you'll have to pay a $100 late fee for waiting. And if you get pulled over, it's going to be about $1,500 to get your car back. Your bills are due today. You want to pay your gas bill for $100, your electric bill for $125, or both. What season is it? <laughs> <laughs> So you pay the electric bill. OK. So this gives you an example. We can't go through the whole thing, but I encourage you to go to placement and walk through it. You need to get through 30 days. I've had groups that make it to 10 days, and then they're done. And that just gives you an idea of walking in the shoes of other people. But more importantly, you start to feel that um, stress and the relentless stress when you don't have uh, control. So I just ask you to just in the few minutes that we did, what you felt throughout the simulator, what are those feelings like compared to when you started? And as we think about the social determinants of health and health disparities, what are some important uh, choices that need to be made to ensure that uh, the adult in the simulator and there's a kid have good outcomes? So it was hit on the head back there with what's all this have to do with health outcomes? It really is stress and your stress yes. levels. Yeah. And the reason that's important is that um, it's highlighted, and I think Unnatural Causes does a great job, but it's really true. You have adrenal glands, um, and those adrenals release cortisol whenever you're stressed. It's really made for if you go out to your car and somebody you know, is trying to rob you, your fight or flight um, sympathetic nervous system will kick in, and you spill cortisol from your adrenal glands. And it makes you run faster. It makes you think quicker. It makes you do a lot of things more efficiently. The problem is when you have that on and it's never turned off, you're spilling cortisol all the time, then it really can be damaging to your body. And so stress management is really important. So as we talk about this kind of recipe for health equity, it's important to have wonderful fresh ingredients and not bring in Popeyes and Taco Bell to the table. Um, and I wish it was as easy as apple pie, but it isn't. And these questions here, I think, get to what I would have discussed. And I gave a TED Talk last year. I presented my recipe for health equity. It's research, which I just submitted my grant today. Education, I love doing these kinds of things and working with students. Community engagement, love getting out on the ground and working with people, identifying what some of the issues are and addressing them. Doing it not just from medicine, but from medicine, public health, working with housing, working with organizations that I'm on the board of, like Girls Inc. and the Urban League. Public health and policy is really important, as you can see, working on the Affordable Care Act really resulted, whether people like the bill or not, in some um, outcomes that are really going to improve people's lives and evaluation. 
I have to put it there because mm -hmm. I'm in public health. Everything we do, we should evaluate. So these are just different things that I've done that fit into my recipe. Um, Nancy Pelosi I met after uh, passing the ACA and just to be and talk to her um, as a physician in support of making sure that people have access to services was really important. Um, as you can see, that's President Obama. <clears throat> and then this is with the Surgeon General. And so I've really taken the message from Nebraska and the many places that I've been uh, across the nation and really to Capitol Hill to really have policies and legislation that impact larger masses of groups of people. So the goal is health equity. And you can read. I don't need to read to you. And thank you. Yes, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them now. I'm sure Dr. Anthony will be glad to help with an answer. I have one question. You hear a lot about uh, people, families. In my family, for instance, diabetes is prevalent. I mean, almost every one of my mother, father, grandparents, genetically. How, how do you ever break that cycle, even if you're exercising? right foods, whatever. Is it something that is just going to be a part of you because of your genetic makeup? or? So there are certain diseases that are genetically transposed. So sickle cell, if you get the sickle cell genes, you're going to have sickle cell and you're going to pass that trait okay. on to your offspring. So that's a whole different discussion sure. than something like diabetes and hypertension. There is a genetic component, but in research we say the genetic component for things that are not like sickle cell can only account for about 20% of the outcomes. And that's where this whole field of epigenetics come in, that you can have the genes, but the environment is what turns those genes on or turns those genes off. It's the difference of having diabetes and being diagnosed at 50 versus doing protective things and you're diagnosed at 75. Before and I haven't been diagnosed at all. That's right, and you're not. <laughs> Just make them keep paying your paycheck, and then <laughs> the greatest predictor of health is wealth. And when you can do things to prevent that, that's what's important. Yes, sir? Uh, you were born in a particular zip code, but you've changed that, and you've changed a lot of uh, things that go on in that. Is that going to change your life expectancy? Um, I'd like to believe so. But science doesn't like stuff like that. It's too messy for the data. And so we know that there, if, if I were born into the zip code that I live in now, my life expectancy would be, say, here. The zip code in which I was born in, my life expectancy is here. So I should you know, average out somewhere in the middle. Um, and I've already seen just differences. And I think the, the greatest thing that I have is I have knowledge. My education has saved not only my life a couple of times, but even family members from being able to say, you know, that's a lymph node that's in your supraclavicular area. It should not be there. Um, it is cancer until proven otherwise. And having family members be like, we just going to pray on that. That's, that's, we just going to pray on it. And I said, no, no, no. There's a reason I'm here. I rarely am home for Thanksgiving. I'm here, it's really important, it needs to be biopsied. And my cousin had Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and he's doing fine. As I said, and that's another weird thing to say, if you're going to choose a cancer, you want to choose Hodgkin's lymphoma or cervical cancer. And they kind of looked at me like, cancer is cancer is cancer, but cancer is not cancer is not cancer, if that makes sense. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on how, um, how funding, that's relate, funding that's sort of addressed intended to address disparities is often targeted towards specific communities and how that kind of plays with this idea that um, those communities are coming from places that have this sort of statistical um, predisposition to having worse outcomes and we oftentimes end up with funding that can't be spent it's hard to spend it sort of together where we're sort of mixing those roams as you're saying where you where you're you're sort of Pulling, especially with kids, where funding goes for certain for certain groups, for certain racial ethnic groups, and it can't be spent on other racial ethnic groups, even though those kids are all together in school. And so, how do you how do we sort of reconcile those <coughs> kinds of situations where 
and, and as you're saying, there are disparities that go beyond just sort of the racial piece, which and you, you were talking about rural versus urban mm -hmm. kind of thing. How do those kind? How do those sort of all work together, or how could we do it better? So, you're going to get your doctorate. <laughs> And for our students in the room, I think it's important who writes those RFAs. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have representation who are writing RFAs, it's going to continue to be what it is and what you've seen. We're going to also continue to see what we call helicoptering in, which has been changed to that's when people come in, they research community and leave and leave nothing behind to this whole idea of mosquitoing in. You go in, you suck the life out of communities, and then you leave them with some zoo zoologist types of diseases. Um, I think that we have made some strides in that area because you hear about it. We want to see in these grants collaboration across disciplines. We want to see that you're working with the community. I think that's one of the most important advances that we've made from how we write RFAs for funding is that you have to show that you're partnering with the community. Community-based participatory research is fairly new. And that's saying, OK, you researchers, what do you know about the communities that you're trying to impact? We're not going to fund this research unless you have community leaders and community people that are influencing and dictating how you roll out your protocols and your plans. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I'm looking for you and the other young people in the group to move it even further. Dude, I'm older than you. <laughs> but you're, you're one of our students. I'm waiting for you to come back. <laughs> Let's give Dr. Thank you.